Okay, folks, we're ready to start a new chapter, chapter eight. What I'm going to do is likely um, break this chapter up into at least three modules because it covers such a wide diverse array of topics. Um, and it, it is a fairly long chapter. So if you think back to A&P 1, we spent some time, if you took it um, at JCC or no matter really where you took it, you should have spent a bit of time reviewing some basic concepts of cell metabolism. And you focused on eukaryotic cell metabolism, of course. Um, we're going to review a bit of eukaryotic cell metabolism, but also transition into the prokaryotic realm as well and talk a little bit about how bacteria metabolize food. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that while we'll be talking about mechanisms um, that relate to eukaryotic cell metabolism, a lot of these same concepts apply to bacteria, although they're, they're different cells, right? They're, they're prokaryotic, not eukaryotic. So I say that with a caveat. But when we talk about how enzymes work, for example, the way that an enzyme would work in your cells um, is very similar to how it would work in E. coli or Bacillus subtilis or Staph epidermidis or whatever bacteria you want to talk about. So when we talk about this concept of metabolism, we have to think about it in a very broad kind of way where we're describing all of the possible chemical reactions that are taking place within a cell. And there's a lot of activity going on in cells. Cells are making proteins. Cells are degrading carbohydrates. Cells are making energy. Cells are dividing. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And so when we, when we think about all of these, these uh, activities that are taking place, you know, within a cell, let's think of them as being composed of both processes that involve the breakdown of big organic molecules into smaller ones, which is in the process um, of catabolism, as you see here on number one of the slide. And in that process of breaking down big organic compounds, cells generate energy, because without energy, you know that cells can't live very long, they'll die. That's the case for any kind of cell, prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So the process of degrading food, if you will, quote unquote, um, is a really important process for cells because that's how they gain the majority of their energy, right? If they're heterotrophic, that's how they do that. If they're autotrophic, then it's a different mechanism altogether. Not only are cells breaking down big molecules into smaller ones and liberating energy that they then utilize, but cells are also taking smaller molecules and building them up into bigger, more complex molecules. And that takes energy. So cells are always balancing this notion of making energy, releasing energy from the food that, that they're degrading, but also utilizing that in anabolic processes to make bigger, more complex carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and that sort of thing that cells need to do. And so we're gonna kind of try to keep that in the back of our minds as we, as we think about this chapter and how cells are balancing catabolism and anabolism within this broader umbrella called metabolism. So one important um, mechanism that uh, is gonna be going on constantly within cells is the, is the uh, catalysis of reactions. And these are the molecules we're going to look at next, enzymes that help in that process of speeding up reactions. And so let's watch this short little video on enzymes. This should be familiar to you. This should be review. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in the cell. A special region on the enzyme called the active site 
has a shape that fits with specific substrate molecules. An enzyme works by binding to one or more specific molecules called reactants or substrates. Binding occurs at the active site. The enzyme and substrates form an enzyme substrate complex. The interactions between the substrates and the enzyme stresses or weakens some of the chemical bonds in the substrates. These stresses encourage a link between the two substrates, leading to the formation of a different molecule. As a result of the chemical interactions within the active site, a new product is formed. The product is released from the active site. The enzyme assumes its original shape and is free to work again. Although this reaction has specifically illustrated the formation of a single product from two substrate molecules, other enzymes catalyze the formation of two products from a single substrate. Okay. At the end of that particular video, the, the narrator made a really important point. And that is not only are enzymes helping to break down bigger molecules into smaller ones, but also are instrumental in taking smaller molecules and building bigger ones from them. Okay, that's an extremely important thing to understand. We tend to think about, enzymes. oops, sorry. We tend to think about enzymes in our digestive system, for example, right? That's where most people think about enzymes, in the digestive system, breaking down carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and so forth. So that is a degradation. That is a catabolic process. But enzymes are also used anabolically as well, making bigger molecules from smaller, simpler ones. Don't lose sight of that fact. It's real important. So whether you're building up or breaking down, as the video just showed, enzymes have to be able to combine with substrate. And the way they do that is by having a particularly shaped active site, a portion of the enzyme where the substrate or substrates, could be more than one, will fit. They, they literally fit like a key in a lock. It's a physical connection at the molecular level. As the video also showed at the very end, when that bigger uh, compound was produced, or the product, I should say, was produced, the enzyme is reused in that reaction. It's not harmed. It's not you know, destroyed at all. It can be reused again and again and again. It's, it's recycled if, in some respects. And that's a great, great thing for cells. They don't have to constantly be making a lot of it if they have intact enzyme there that is always working. Another thing to keep in mind when you think about enzymes is the fact that many of them have this suffix ASE at the end of the word. So if you ever see a term with ASE at the end, that is an enzyme. You again have heard of some of these amylase, um, carboxylase, sucrase, peptidase, lipase, think back to A and P2 when you covered the digestive system and you learned some of those enzymes. Now, not, not all of them end in ASE, right? I'm thinking like trypsin, there's one that doesn't end in ASE. So not all of them do, but any that do end in ASE are enzymes. So how do these enzymes help speed reactions? Okay, getting into just a little bit of um, biochemistry here, a little bit of, of physics. What enzymes do is they make reactions occur more efficiently for the cell. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's assume that we have this particular reactant shown by the red circle and the blue triangle. And that's where we're starting in our reaction with the reactant. And the enzyme is going to basically degrade this reactant into two final products. So this is going to be a catabolic reaction, a breakdown of a, of a bigger molecule into two smaller ones. Okay. So the progress of the reaction shown from left to right on the x-axis and on the y-axis is this, this notion of the energy state of the reaction. It gets kind of complicated, but let's 
let's just assume for the, for the time being that this reactant has a particular energy state associated with it, as do the products. They have a lower energy state. So in order to convert this reactant into the two products, the enzyme is going to be assisting the cell in doing so. Now let's just take an example or assume for the, for the time being that we don't have an enzyme available to help us do that. Could the cell theoretic, theoretically still convert the reactant into the products? And the answer is yes, it could. But in order to do so, it would have to incorporate a particular amount of energy into the system to weaken the bonds here between these two components of the reactants, break them, and that would liberate the two end products. And so what I've depicted on this slide with the larger green curve here is the amount of energy that would have to be invested into the system in order to break those bonds. It's called the energy of activation or the E sub A. And you'll note that in this particular example, it's a fairly significant amount of energy that would have to be incorporated into the system to eventually make the products. If we now use an enzyme to assist us in converting the reactant into the two end products, we would be looking at this lighter green curve. Notice what's happened to the E sub A when we have the enzyme present. It has been reduced, right? If you look at the height of the small green hill compared to the height of the big green hill, it's obviously smaller. It's sort of like using the metaphor or the analogy of you are a skier and you're up on the up on the mountain and you want to get down to the chalet after a long day of skiing. You have two options. You can get to the chalet, but first you've got to climb a larger hill. And then you can ski down. Or if you want, you can climb a smaller hill and ski down to the same chalet. Which hill do you want to climb? Well, if you want to expend less energy, you're going to choose the smaller green hill as opposed to the larger green hill, which is going to require more effort on your part to get to where you want to go. You're starting at the same place, you're ending at the same place. Same, same sort of idea with regard to energy levels of reactants and products. The only difference here is how much energy do we want to incorporate into the system to get to where we want to go. And so the enzyme's role here is in making this a more efficient process for a cell. The cell can expend less energy by utilizing the enzyme. And that's really the goal here, to be most efficient as possible. That's what cells have evolved the means to do, use their energy most efficiently. So enzymes help to lower that E sub A. Let's talk a little bit about how, you know, how enzymes are classified and we can talk about both simple and conjugated or holoenzyme categories. So if we have just the enzyme alone and realize that enzymes are made of proteins, if it's just the enzyme alone, it's referred to as a simple enzyme. But oftentimes, Enzymes are not just the protein alone, they have additional add-ons, if you will. And that's what we mean here by conjugated enzymes or sometimes just called holoenzymes. So holoenzymes will have the simple enzyme shown here in purple, but will have these add-ons. Okay, so here we're looking at the enzyme itself called the apoenzyme. So it's sort of like 
the simple enzyme, if you will. But we've added to that a cofactor of some sort. So think of cofactors as enzyme helpers. These are typically non-protein add-ons to the enzyme, bonded to the apoenzyme portion. So what we can see here, of course, is in red, a metal that can be often uh, part of that apoenzyme. The cofactor is an inorganic compound in this particular example. Okay. Inorganic means no carbon, no hydrogen. So any of the metals are by definition inorganic. Once in a while, you can have cofactors that are organic. We call them coenzymes. So here we see in yellow, a, an add-on cofactor that happens to be organic. And then we can sometimes have holo, holo enzymes that have both inorganic and organic cofactors attached, like we see here in the third example. Okay, so we need to just expand our thinking a little bit about that protein, that enzyme. The fact that yes, there are some that are just protein alone, but typically enzymes are conjugated. They have enzyme helpers added to them in the form of these cofactors. And we're gonna talk specifically about these two cofactors, which happen to be coenzymes called NADH and FADH2 a little bit later. Another important concept to try to think a little bit about is the structure of the protein, the, pro the structure of the, of the enzyme itself. Most of it is protein. And we can think about proteins as having different levels of organization. We can talk about the most simplistic level of organization called the primary structure of the enzyme, which is nothing more than the peptide bonds between the amino acids within that polypeptide. So we're gonna use this sort of model here, this kind of squiggly line to represent um, the three-dimensional shape that a bunch of amino acids would take on if they were linked together. But we need to understand that most proteins are more, complex, more complicated than simply their primary structure. The fact that there can be, and often is, bonding between different regions of the primary structure that lead us to what is referred to as a secondary structure. So this is the secondary structure is a higher level organization, organizational schematic due to bonding between different regions within the primary structure. And this often leads to a folding of the enzyme to form this three-dimensional tertiary structure, which forms in turn that region of the enzyme called the active site. So typically you have to have at least tertiary structure to an enzyme before you can form that three-dimensional region where the substrate or substrates will bond. Okay, so when enzymes are made, they go through this primary, secondary, and then tertiary uh, change, if you will, in terms of their structure. Some enzymes can even have what, are ref what is referred to as quaternary structure, which is another level of organization above tertiary. And that's shown here at the bottom. And in this particular example of, of quaternary structure, we have a, an even more complicated scenario whereby we have two tertiary structured proteins that are combining together, okay, to make a quaternary structured protein. And we can see as evidenced by the black arrows, we can have actually more than one active site where these two tertiary level of proteins come together. So, so we again have to just kind of keep, keep, keep this in our back of our minds as we think about how enzymes work. They can get into pretty complex structures, these, these enzymes. 
with more than one active site even. We will most of the time talk about tertiary structure of proteins, of enzymes, and refer to a single active site. Okay, so let's think back to that video we watched about 10 or 15 minutes ago. And remember that each of these enzymes has a particular region called the active site where a certain shaped substrate will fit. Once that substrate fits into the active site of the, of the enzyme, we make what is referred to as an enzyme substrate complex. That's followed by the conversion of that substrate into products, typically a result of changing in bonding between different regions of the substrate. So in this particular example, where we have the breakdown of a larger, more complex substrate into smaller, simpler products, this would be you know, a catabolic reaction. When that substrate fits with the enzyme and makes the complex, there can be a temporary um, shift in the shape of that protein, of that enzyme, that is referred to as induced fit. That in turn leads to the formation of the product, and then the enzyme will revert back into the pre-combination stage, if you will, before it combined with the substrate, it goes back to its original conformation. Now I know that that these these purple proteins all look the same, but actually this is this should be thought of as a slight change in the shape of the enzyme once it combines with the substrate, and then once the products are are produced, the enzyme reverts back to its original conformation. So there's this sort of transitional state that they talk about when the substrate and the enzyme are are combined. Okay. We mentioned that coenzymes can be enzyme helpers and that they can be part of the enzyme, right? In this particular example, we're looking at an apoenzyme here in purple. Here's the coenzyme in blue. This is gonna be our, our assistant here. And what this coenzyme is gonna assist the enzyme in doing is in transferring a CH group, a methyl group it's called, from one substrate to another, okay? So here are the two substrates, one in green, one in pink. They're gonna fit into the active site of the enzyme as has occurred here. But what the coenzyme helper is going to do is it's going to assist in the transfer of this methyl group from the first substrate to the second substrate. And that's what's happened here. The end result will be the release of the products, S sub one and S sub two. But notice that these products that have been produced, even though we use the term substrate, they're really products. We've altered them, haven't we? When you compare the substrates that came into the enzyme, into the reaction, remember substrate one had the methyl group, substrate two did not. Look at the end products. Substrate one or product one has lost its methyl group. It's been altered chemically, hasn't it? While substrate two or product two has acquired this CH or methyl group. It has been altered compared to what it was when it first came into the enzyme. So by definition, the enzyme has helped to change those compounds into new compounds. But the point again here, the takeaway message is that the coenzyme here, C, has assisted in that transfer of the methyl group. And so it has assisted. It has become a real important helper to the enzyme in, in that process of transfer of that methyl group. Sometimes enzymes need to be secreted outside of the cell before they can combine with substrate to make products. So we call these exoenzymes. They have to be exported. That's the way to remember that, exo, 
They do their work outside of the cell. So here's a bacterial cell, let's say, that has got enzyme shown by the purple uh, structures. But in order to work on those substrates, in order to convert those substrates into products, the enzyme has to be secreted outside the cell. And there they will do their work. The vast majority of, of bacterial enzymes and even enzymes that you have in, in your body, eukaryotic cells, will generally bring the product into the cell. And then these endoenzymes will work in breaking down or maybe building up, depends on what it is, altering the substrates into some products. So this is util utilization internally, endoenzymes. Constitutive enzymes, what are those? Well, these represent enzymes that are typically present in a fairly finite constant concentration within the cell. So we're gonna, we're gonna be assuming here that we're talking about endoenzymes. So regardless of how much substrate is brought into the cell and altered by the cell, the cell keeps its enzyme concentration fairly fixed, okay? A fixed amount, regardless of whether there's a lot of enzyme, a lot of substrate to be converted or very little. The amount of enzyme is constant. But what is probably a little more likely in many types of cells is that enzymes aren't always there in constant equal concentrations, regardless of the amount of substrate. Regulated enzymes are going to be more abundant when there's more substrate to be converted and be less abundant when there's less substrate to be converted. In other words, this is, this is a much more efficient system for a cell to utilize in terms of, of breaking down or building up compounds. If it needs to break down more materials because there's more substrate to be you know, converted, then the cell is gonna make more enzyme. If there's less substrate to be converted, the cell doesn't need more, than, more enzyme than it, than it needs to use, so it won't produce as many enzyme molecules. And so what regulates whether a cell makes more enzyme or doesn't is again affected by the amount of substrate. But more, more broadly or, or more specifically, I guess is the way to think of it, how does a cell know to make more enzyme if there's more substrate? Well, this is determined really by the activation or deactivation of genes within its chromosome, okay? So if there's more substrate, that triggers the activation of genes, which in turn activates the production of the enzyme. If there's less substrate, that will turn off the gene, which will result in less production of the enzyme. Okay. We'll kind of review that in just a few minutes with another slide. Well, we have been talking about how enzymes can be used catabolically and anabolically. Here, we're gonna talk about some specific names of reactions that are anabolic and or catabolic. So if we're talking about the production of bigger, more complex molecules from smaller, simpler ones, we're gonna be describing what are referred to as condensation reactions. Utilizing enzymes, of course, as do all reactions. So in this particular example, we have a, an enzyme shown here in purple. Here are the two substrate molecules. They happen to be glucose molecules that fit into the active sites of this enzyme. The end result is the formation of a bigger, more complex compound called maltose. This is a disaccharide. These are monosaccharides. Remember that from a &P or biology. So what has occurred? Well, we have literally formed a bond early on in that induced fit 
step, stage, if you will, of the reaction. So this, this oxygen of this uh, glucose is this oxygen right here. And you'll notice in yellow, we've circled the OH group of one glucose and the hydrogen of one OH group of the other glucose. These combine to form water. So in condensation reactions, really two things happen. Number one, we make a bigger, more complex molecule from two smaller, simpler ones, as well as production of a water molecule for each connection that's being made here. This takes energy to make bigger, more complex molecules. Anabolism requires energy. Cells have to expend energy to do this. It doesn't come free. In fact, it's very costly for a cell to make protein, to make carbohydrate, to make lipid, to make more nucleic acid. It's highly expensive for cells to do that, but they have to do that. They have to be able to make more organic compounds. If they're gonna divide, for example, they have to supply their daughter cells with all of those different compounds that the cells are gonna need. Contrast this with a reaction called hydrolysis, which is just the opposite. This is taking a bigger, more complex compound and breaking it down into smaller, simpler ones. So here's a different enzyme. Here we have a dipeptide molecule, meaning two amino acids that have been linked together. Again, go back, review a and P1. If you forget what a dipeptide is or look it up on the internet, it's two amino acids linked together via a peptide bond, dipeptide. And so in this particular example, we are incorporating water into the system. And notice where that H2O goes. An OH group of the water is added on to one of the amino acids and the other hydrogen is added to the other amino acid. We also break this peptide bond and we release those products. So again, here's our renewable, reusable enzyme, of course, and it has released the two products. Notice they are smaller, simpler molecules, obviously compared to the dipeptide that first started this process off. And again, water was necessary to be incorporated into the system because it is basically split and then used and added on to the two products. When this takes place, not only are we making smaller, simpler molecules from bigger ones, but we're producing energy. And we're gonna get into this and review this in the next module. This is basically cellular metabolism, how cells make energy by breaking down bigger, more complex molecules catabolically. Okay, let's watch this sh short little video on the role of enzymes in biochemical pathways. Organisms contain many different kinds of enzymes that catalyze a variety of different reactions. Many of these reactions, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, a substrate is converted into a product by the first enzyme in the pathway, and the product of the first reaction then becomes the substrate for the next reaction. The product of the first reaction then becomes the substrate for the second enzyme. The sequence of reactions continues until the final product is made. When a biochemical pathway is functioning, the initial substrate is continually converted to the final product through the series of steps in the pathway. Okay, so when we think of enzymes, we have to understand 
that while they catalyze a single reaction, they don't function in a vacuum because within cells, you have a myriad of reactions as we'll see in, an, in another slide coming up. And each of those reactions often produces a product which becomes the substrate for another enzyme to convert it. So there's, there's a constant conversion of molecules, not just a single conversion, but a myriad pathway of conversion uh, due to a multitude of enzymes all working together, really. Here's a quick little uh, quiz question. An enzyme is what? Of the five choices, if you said D, you were right. So let's talk a little bit next about how enzymes can be influenced by outside environmental conditions. Ordinarily, cells, whether they're eukaryotic or prokaryotic, live within an environment that optimizes their function. So think of, for example, your cells in your body. They work best, most efficiently at body temperature. And depending upon where the cell lives, it functions best within a narrow pH range. When you start to potentially change the environmental conditions of a cell, you can often alter the enzyme function of that cell. And the best example that we can talk about is what happens when, for example, we increase the temperature beyond the comfort zone, if you will, of the cell, or we alter the pH, or we alter the salinity, or we alter the osmotic pressure of the cell. There are a host of environmental conditions that need to be made. And if you alter or, or, or deviate from those, it can have major implications on the cell. It can kill the cell. Well, the cell often dies because of its enzymes not being able to work properly. And so if you subject, again, a cell to increased temperature, that's a good example to give. What will often happen is you'll begin to alter the three-dimensional conformation of that enzyme. Now go back about 10 slides. Remember we talked about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins. Remember, um, all enzymes are made of proteins. So the three-dimensional shape of that protein, let's just say the tertiary structure, is important in the um, development of the active site where the substrate fits. So if you start increasing temperature, you're gonna to start to affect the structure of the protein. You're gonna to start to alter the bonds between different regions of the protein to the point at which you're going to start manipulating and altering the shape of the active site. And if you change the active site shape, can the substrate fit? The answer, of course, is no. So when that process occurs, we often use the term denaturation to describe a significant alteration of the three-dimensional conformation or shape of the protein, of the enzyme, to the point at which the active site no longer is shaped properly, and therefore the substrate cannot be converted. The best example that I can give you, and the one that I use in a and all the time, is think of a, of a simple paper clip. It has a particular shape to it, obviously. And that particular shape is really important in allowing it to function. In this case, it helps me hold my two pieces of paper together, right? Works very well. But if I now take this protein that has a particular three-dimensional conformation and I subject it again to higher temperature, significant drop in pH, change in um, osmotic pressure, for example, what am I gonna do to this paperclip? Well, 
Let's change its shape. Suddenly my paper clip now has been altered significantly. It's been denatured. Can it function in helping to hold my pieces of paper together? The answer of course is no. So just think, paper clip analogy maybe, when you think about denaturation and what happens. Now, this is getting a little bit off topic, but once in a while, some proteins can be renatured back into their normal three-dimensional shape. We won't get into renaturation, but sometimes that can happen. Typically, once enzymes are denatured, they're not renatured. They're not going to function. Okay, well, you saw in one of the earlier, uh, in the last video actually, how once a particular substrate was converted by enzyme number one, it became the substrate for the next enzyme, right? Even though we call it a product, the product can become the substrate for the next enzyme and so on and so forth. So enzymes work in, in tandem. They work together, not voluntarily, obviously they're molecules, but within the cellular metabolism process, we can talk about a particular starting molecule, call it A, and we can talk about a particular ending molecule, call it, you know, S. And between A and S are, I don't know how many letters. Each of those conversions is catalyzed by a reaction. Okay, so to convert A into B, we would need enzyme number one. To convert B into C, we would need enzyme number two. To convert C into D, we need enzyme number three and so on and so forth. So we could have dozens and dozens and dozens of enzymes working in particularly important ways to convert specific substances into other compounds. So we talk about multi-enzyme systems in cells, in cellular metabolic pathways. Sometimes they're linear, one leading to another and two leading to another and so on until some end product is produced. Sometimes they're cyclical. Okay, when I look at this, I think of citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle. Um, some reactions are divergent, some are convergent. There's a whole host of different pathways that different uh, molecules take on or cells use to produce a desired end product. But again, the takeaway message here is that all of these individual conversion reactions is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. Well, what are some controlling impacts? What are some things that regulate or affect enzyme function? Well, we've already talked about denaturation, but here we're talking about something a little bit different. How can we stop an enzyme from working? Why would we want to do that? Well, let's talk about that. In this first example called competitive inhibition, we're talking about how an enzyme, which would ordinarily convert a normal shaped substrate, can't because there's another molecule that competes with the substrate for the enzyme's active site. Okay, so if we introduce a competitive inhibitor molecule into the reaction, let's say there's a higher concentration of competitive inhibitor than there is normal substrate. There's gonna be more active site being occupied by that competitive inhibitor. If you compete with the substrate for the active site, can the cell convert substrate into product? The answer, of course, is no, because you're blocking the active site. There can be tons of substrate out here, but if you don't have open active sites, you're not going to convert it, right? So once in a while, these competitive inhibitors can help to regulate how much end product is produced, can limit it. Compare that, oh, well, that's before we go into that, let's mention, this is an interesting box, I forgot about this. Um, when we talk about how certain antibiotics function, 
many antibiotics kill bacteria by acting as competitive inhibitors. In other words, if a bacterium needs to convert ample substrate into ample product using a particular enzyme, and that's critical to the life of the cell, let's say it's the ability of the cell to make more peptidoglycan as it goes to divide. Remember, peptidoglycan is an integral part of the cell wall of most bacteria. Well, you've heard of penicillin, all right, an antibiotic. What penicillin does is it competes for the actocyte of an enzyme necessary to make peptidoglycan. So if I'm blocking the active site of this very critical, important enzyme in the pathway that a cell will use to make peptidoglycan, and now the cell can't do that, it can't make normal daughter cells. And therefore, you might be stopping that infection by not allowing the bacteria to reproduce. So that example is a good one to think of with respect to how, how the drug, the antibiotic, acts as a competitive inhibitor, preventing the normal conversion of that bacterial substrate into a different substrate or product. Here's another mechanism called non-competitive inhibition. And as the name sort of implies, this doesn't involve competing with the active site like we saw earlier, but rather what these compounds do is they bond to another region of the enzyme protein called the allosteric site or regulatory site. So in this example, here's our normal active site. Here's this newly introduced concept of a regulatory site or allosteric site. If there's nothing in the regulatory site, the cell can take that substrate, combine it with the enzyme, make the desired end products. However, if we introduce a substance into the regulatory site, and in this case, look what that is. It could be a product produced. That changes the shape of the active site such that the substrate cannot be converted. So in other words, once a cell produces enough adequate end product, oftentimes, it can result in less product being made because enough is being produced. So we don't wanna produce more than we need. So the production of the end product can also cause the reduction in the conversion of the substrate into more product than is necessary by having this product act as a non-competitive inhibitor. Let's watch a video on that. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction. If the end product of a pathway, such as an amino acid, becomes available in the environment, it is unnecessary and wasteful for the cells to continue to produce the product. Cells, therefore, have the ability to shut down a pathway when it is not needed. In feedback inhibition, the end product of the pathway reacts with the first enzyme that is unique to the pathway. The reaction occurs at a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site, called the allosteric site. When the product binds to the allosteric site, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and can no longer react with its substrate. There is no substrate for subsequent steps in the pathway, and the final product is no longer synthesized. So this simply um, increases the effectiveness and the, um, what's the word? The efficiency of the cell. It does not need to produce more product than it needs sometimes. And so this, this not competitive inhibition helps the cell be more efficient in its metabolism. Now, another way that a cell can reduce the amount of enzyme present 
once products get to a certain level is through a process called enzyme repression. So this is a little bit different than what we just saw in the earlier video. But this is, this is not difficult to understand the concept of. So let's assume that the enzyme has combined with substrate to form the desired end product. Same old stuff we talked about up to this point. But the cell does not want to make too much product. Now, we just saw earlier that sometimes these products can feed back onto the allosteric site, altering the shape of the protein unless substrate gets converted. However, another way that the cell can slow down production of product is by making less enzyme. Okay. So when the product level gets to a certain point, gets to a certain level, certain concentration, let's say, what that does is that basically turns off the gene in the chromosome. So here we have DNA, you all recognize this double-stranded molecule of DNA. And if you, if you turn off the gene, if you will, if you don't let that gene get expressed, you're not gonna be making product. Why? Because you're not gonna be making enzyme. So in essence, the cell is not going to be able to take that gene transcribe it from DNA into RNA, translate that into protein, and in turn produce the necessary enzyme. So you're just shutting down transcription and translation, which ultimately produces the protein. Closing it down. That's enzyme repression at the, at the, at the gene level. Okay. So to summarize what we've just talked about for the last hour or two, we've described enzymes a lot. We've mentioned that they're all proteins, that sometimes they require helpers in the form of cofactors. Those could be non-protein cofactors, non-organic non cofactors. Other, time, other kinds of, of enzyme helpers can be organic. Um, we've talked about how they speed up reactions how they're reusable. We've described how they lower that initial investment of energy. So it's a more efficient process. They lower the E sub A for the reaction. We've talked about how their particular conformation or shape is critical in terms of what substrates can combine and be altered by the enzyme. Um, we've also described how typically enzymes are reusable. They're renewable, right? That's an important thing. And the fact that they can be impacted when you alter their environmental conditions. You can denature the protein, you can change the three-dimensional shape such that the active site is altered, cannot, it cannot combine with substrate, and you can't produce product. And finally, we've just talked about some different regulatory mechanisms that ensure that a cell doesn't make too much product. And if it does, how can we slow down the conversion of that substrate into that product by either making less enzyme or preventing that enzyme from functioning, uh, i.e. competitive inhibition. So spend some time um, in the first segment of chapter eight. And uh, in the next uh, lecture, we'll get into uh, energy usage and get into some biochemistry.